I'm vegan. I don't eat meat or chicken or pork or fish or eggs or dairy. I wasn't born like this. In fact, being vegan or even vegetarian wasn't really a viable option for me in the 70s and 80s. If I had told my mom that I felt weird about eating animals, she would have been like, what? People didn't survive the Holocaust so you could complain about what I put in front of you. True story. Most of us grow up with no idea how food gets to our plate. But this not knowing is actually a pretty new phenomenon in the course of human history. Up until fairly recently, pretty much everybody knew that the lamb chop on your plate came from that guy who owns all the lambs. And the cheese and milk that we eat is from the lady with all the cows and goats. And that guy named Gonzo with all of his chicken friends, he's responsible for the abundance of eggs. Everyone knew that eating meat meant that an animal had been slaughtered for their meal, period. Cut to the 21st century and we don't think about this stuff because we don't have to. Meat and eggs and dairy are processed somewhere and they end up on our plate and they taste good. And most people don't feel the need to say anything more about that than, it's yummy and I like it. The problem is that since the Industrial Revolution, things have changed dramatically in terms of food and how we eat and prepare it. The result is that food producers seek to make the most product for the least amount of money so that they can make the most profit. Makes sense, right? Well... Let's pretend that we're looking at a factory that produces, say, chicken breasts. Mmm, chicken breasts. Let's say you want to produce a lot of chicken breasts so that you can sell them to supermarkets for the least amount of money so that you can keep the most profit for yourself. If they want to pay you $1,000 for your chicken breasts, but it costs you $900 to produce chicken breasts, you only get to keep $100 for yourself. But let's say it only costs you $500 to produce chicken breasts, then you get to keep $500 for yourself. Make sense? Got it? Okay. So there are a few things you have to do to make the most chicken breasts for the lowest price so that as much as possible of the profit goes to you. Number one, grow more chickens faster. How do you make chickens grow faster? Genetic selection. Take the fastest growing chickens in your coop, breed them with a rooster, repeat selection, and breed again. Over several generations, you will have created a very special genetic line of chickens. Yes, that's how it works. It's science. Number two, spend less on the chickens. So for example, chickens need to be slaughtered and the goal is to find the fastest way to do it. And something you may not know about chickens is they don't like to be kept close together. So if you're cutting costs, you can't let them live in spacious living quarters, right? They need to be packed together tightly in cages. But because they're a persnickety social species, if you pack them that tight together, they start fighting and pecking each other with their beaks. So how do you deal with this unpleasantness? You cut off their beaks. Problem solved. <coughs> Okay, how else can we cut costs? Number three, spend as little money as possible on the factory itself. The factory can't cost too much, either in its construction or its upkeep. This might mean building the smallest space possible to save on construction costs, or it might mean not maintaining the facility's inspections and cleanliness because that stuff can cost a lot of money. And if you hire workers who typically don't have legal defense or union support, you get cheaper labor and you can even work them longer hours because you don't have to pay overtime. These three examples of ways to cut costs in order to make the most profit show that if we think only of economics as what drives us in food production, we produce economically efficient food. But the question is, at what cost? It's convenient to think of a living, breathing animal as a walking sandwich, and it makes for lots of snarky jokes you can present to vegans. Hey, Maya, what do you call a fuzzy piglet? <laughs> what? Lunch. Oh. This is a good one. How do I show how much I love animals? How? by eating them. Oh. But this kind of convenience only works if you turn animals into an abstraction from the safety of your home. But that's not right, because animals aren't an abstraction. Animals live, they breathe, they have relationships, they have feelings. Millions of animals right now spend their lives in a cage with their beaks torn off, living in hostile situations, unable to stand from the weight of the bodies they have been bred into. And this is not about placing human rights onto the lives of animals, because that's what crazy vegans do. I'm making an argument that our obsession with what's most efficient is causing us to objectify other living beings, and not just animals. Look how quick we are to ignore the rights of humans who work in the factories to produce the food that ends up on our plates. When we intentionally seek out workers who cannot defend themselves against unsafe work environments, when we don't pay workers a fair wage, when we compromise people's civil rights in order to maximize profit, we start seeing our fellow human beings as objects to be used rather than partners in a respectful and dignified society. But it doesn't have to be this way, just like it didn't used to be this way. Animals lived symbiotically with humanity for most of human history. When we cared for their needs, gave them room to roam, nutritionally appropriate food to eat, 
so that when it came time to take their lives, we honored that life because we know that it had been treated with respect. I understand that it's easier not to think about these things, and I can't make you. My hope is that someday we'll get closer to a healthier and more ethical balance for all. Until then, I'm vegan. Thanks for watching, subscribe to my channel, and check out the links below for more information.